The following program is a co-production with EWTN and the Tim and Steph Bush School of Business and Economics of the Catholic University of America. Welcome to A Force for Good. I'm Jay Richards with the Bush School of Business and Economics at the Catholic University of America in our nation's capital. In this series, we want to inspire you not only to find peace and satisfaction through your work, but to stir you to something greater in both your work and your faith. Our families, our neighborhoods, and our nation all depend on business. We all rely on it for our material needs, but does business shape us or do we as Catholics shape it? And how do we understand the economy? How do we apply the principles of Catholic social teaching so that business really is a force for good in the world? Those are the questions we hope to help answer in every episode. We'll bring you moving stories of men and women in business who have found that success doesn't have to come at the expense of their faith. On the contrary, their faith has helped them succeed by serving others in the marketplace. We'll talk to leading experts who can help us figure out how to apply our Catholic faith in the public square so that we not only mean well, but do good for our fellow human beings. And we won't avoid the controversies. We'll grapple with how to understand free enterprise, socialism, wages, poverty, technology, trade, and money. Our first story is about John Abate, a successful California businessman who learned how to see his work is a way to bless both his customers and his employees. Morning. What's up, guys? Tamika, what's going on? It's 6 a.m. and John Abate begins his day, like every other day, at one of his McDonald's restaurants. John grew up with McDonald's. His father, Tony, opened a McDonald's franchise in Merced, California in 1969. It quickly became a family business. We got in early because our first store's number was 1313, and there's over 35,000 today. When we first opened, we were all pretty excited, and uh, Jane was there on our opening day with the kids. They need to be McDonaldized and feel a part of it and sort of they have the little hats and they would clean up the lot. They would pick up cigarette butts. They would come in on Saturdays and scrape gum from under tables. They would do things like that. And as they uh, got older, uh, when they were 14, that's about the time they actually started working in the restaurant. It had a huge influence on us. And I think the most important thing is, is that it, you know, we started from the very bottom. After high school, John went to the University of San Diego, where he focused on finance, accounting, and economics, with no intention of going into the McDonald's business upon graduation. I had a chance to sit down with John and talk to him about the opportunity I thought that we had together. And John and I had worked together before. I think at that point, he was probably leaning towards maybe working uh, on the commodities market in Chicago, something like that, the Chicago Mercantile. And I said, listen, I said, um, that'd be a great career. I said, but I tell you, I said, I think this is a huge opportunity for us together. So what kind of a word is that? We were married on July 11th, 1992, um, and then started our life here. He decided while he was at Notre Dame, he really wanted to go back and work for the family and that he felt like he could really make a difference. She didn't love Merced, but she became a part of the Merced community. And I found coming back into the McDonald's business that it was, it was everything and more. Trying to have children, adopting children in the process of John, trying to take over um, his part in the McDonald's and to grow the McDonald's. Um, it took a lot of faith, a lot of perseverance. I really was pushing myself to the limit. And certainly with this young family and the children and all the time and energy it takes, I, I certainly didn't do a very good job balancing that entire portfolio 
of responsibility. I'm in my 30s. I've got to make my mark. This is my opportunity. You know, I'm, I've got this skill set, and it's, and it's time for me to maximize that skill set. And that's my mentality. My problem was my ambition just took over. I had this, this goal, and it was driving this business. Um, so ultimately, it got to a point where we really it started to affect our marriage and our relationship. I didn't really get how you balance all this thing, you know? Um, so I really struggled with that. And all of a sudden I had this overwhelming desire to go to Magigoria, And I have no reason why. You know, and I, I just really felt like if that's what you're called to do and if this is going to be something that's going to change your life and our life, go for it. It was a week in prayer. It was a week in solitude. It was, uh, there was nothing about work um, there, and it really allowed me to refocus on what I really wanted out of my life. John came back from Medjugorje with a renewed spirit and dedication on how to get some balance back into his life. It's easy to say, but much more difficult to do. And I tell you, I struggled with it. He went to different countries, and his purpose was faith, and um, I think almost rediscov rediscovering himself. Um, so I think. Uh, each time that he came back from a different pilgrimage, it, um, I could see there was a change. I read this beautiful book, Ordinary Work, Extraordinary Grace, and it had a profound impact on me. It's all about how to live, live your vocation through your work and your everyday life. And it's this theology of work, this uh, theology of divine filiation. You know, we are God's children now. And how do we permeate God's love into the workplace? How do we take on work as truly a vocation? No different than a priest takes on the vocation of his priestly duties. And that opened my eyes to you know, how I could still be this really great um, employer, um, executive, um, you know, talented business person, but do it in a way that was actually sanctifying my work and one more extension of my faith. In John's search to re-educate himself on the human person and to apply that aspect of his faith in his business, he decided to get a master's degree in Catholic theology. It was really interesting on how the leadership principles that govern everyday business are the same leadership principles we need in the church, and it's all about relationships. But not just frivolous, you know, I want to be your friend and I want you to be my friend. It's about how do we have a professional relationship that allows us both to be better. And I realized that, you know, ultimately our essential purpose is about being a gift to others. It's not just about being a gift to ourselves and maximizing our own utility. And so it was one more opportunity for me to think about the business differently. Think about the fact that I have an incredible opportunity to make an impact on people's lives. Just being there to say hi and smile and give somebody a little bit of extra attention in the workplace or helping somebody get to college or helping somebody use McDonald's as a bridge into their next career, it's all opportunity for me to use my vocation in a different fashion other than just simply making money. John saw potential in me that I didn't see and he would always encourage me, Fatima, are you happy? Are you content? Is everything okay? He's touched my life in many ways. Um, spiritually, um, financially, he's um, done so much that there's no words that I can think of because he believed in me when nobody else would. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be the man I am today. He kind of was the only person in my life at that point that kind of pushed me the right direction and kind of held me accountable for my actions. I've been here 13 years and I've been a manager going on nine years. And I stay here and I stick with the position because it's a lot more than burgers and fries. You know, you get to affect people in a positive way. Uh, you get to affect lives. It's at the end of the day, it's something that makes you you're proud to do it. He's not the kind of person that he's only looking at the business. He's looking at your life. When he talks to me, he's like more, oh, um, it's a new challenge for you. Every time when he says something like that, it's something that makes me more strong. 
The door's always open. He's very compassionate. Good morning. Good morning. You know, I mean, he's a businessman, don't get me wrong, but you could go to him for anything. And so that's why I stay here, you know. I, I'm a loyal employee, but they've been loyal employers. One of the things that I try to take on as an employer is to continually challenge my employees to continue to be better, push themselves outside of their comfort zone challenge themselves to be better tomorrow than they are today. We've been having Aiden, um, There's a lot of people that are very loyal to him, including me, because I've been here for so many years, 24 years is a long time to be with, you know, in a company. But he always challenges us to be better. John's role on the business side is very important just because of his business acumen and his marketing knowledge that he brings. But the other part that John really brings is just the community aspect. And through his faith, he's got a strong, um, belief in, in the impact that he can make in, in the community. So his morals and his values come through in the way that he runs his restaurants. John is a great owner, operator. He's a great boss. Um, he encourages you to proceed your dreams. Let it be McDonald's or let it be something else. Um, his thing has always been family first. I just love that about him. The awareness of the role and responsibility we play in these folks' lives um, is inspirational for me. It allows me to get up every day and go to work with a renewed sense of zeal uh, with that responsibility. And I see opportunities everywhere now. I see so many opportunities that I didn't see 10 or 15 years ago because I see these folks as human beings with lives, whether it's within the McDonald's world or not. John and his brother Jim own 29 McDonald's franchises in the Merced, California region and employ some 1,500 people. I think for this community, for Merced, is a source of income for many families. Many families depend on that income. They are giving the community members, including myself, the opportunity to have a job and to have that income that is supporting us every day, you know, to have a place to live, money to put food in our table. So as an employer, I've thought a lot about the understanding of minimum wage and as a Catholic employer, certainly about just, just wage versus living wage. And, and, I, and there's certainly a difference between just wage and living wage and minimum wage. And I think it's incredibly important that we understand that um, we are to, to pay just wages. You know, that's our role and responsibility, uh, our fiduciary responsibility as good employers to pay just wage. And many times the market dictates what a just wage is. I think the minimum wage should stay the way it is so that we can give opportunity, especially in the small town like Merced. I mean, there's so much unemployment and we have McDonald's and the young people are coming out of school so they can have this part-time job. When the minimum wage is going to be like higher, obviously then we have to be careful whom we are hiring. An entry-level job isn't really meant to carry you through life. You know, I really strongly believe that an entry-level job is going to pay you an entry-level wage and hopefully you'll go to school, you'll get an education and you'll have something to fall back on and not just rely on minimum wage, whatever it may be. There's so many companies now that see how blending the principles of business and blending the principles of the common good together for the good of the entire culture. You know, if I believe my, my job is my vocation, it's my opportunity to do the best I can, not only for myself, but for the culture in general and for the common good, then business opens up an incredible amount of opportunity for you. John Abate's story raises hard questions about the role of entry-level wages and about the whole issue of a just wage or a living wage. Dr. Sam Gregg of the Acton Institute is an expert on questions at the intersection of economics and Catholic social teaching. Sam, thanks for joining us. Jay, it's always good to be with you. So let's help us untangle this a little bit, because I know this is actually a very complicated issue, but if uh, people read the scholastics or read Catholic social teaching, there are references to things like a living wage or a family wage or just wage or just price. What's going on there? I mean, is there a consistent and clear meaning that, that popes, uh, when they refer to this, are, are they talking about the same thing? Yeah, they are, in the sense that on one level, wages, like any other aspect of the economy, are subject to the forces of supply and demand. So people are paid depending upon forces ranging from 
what their skill set is, what they're good at, how long they're prepared to work for, and of course things like the condition of the business, whether a business can afford to pay wages at a certain degree of level. And the catechism, for example, identifies all these different conditions that have to be thought about when we're talking about wages. So there's a very strong economic emphasis. At the same time, for many people, particularly since the Industrial Revolution, wages has been the main way in which most people have earned their income. So what that means is that the church has thought about this in terms of what does it take someone to be paid if they're going, to, for example, to have a family or to be married. So in other words, what the church is trying to do here is to bring it together this economic knowledge about how wages work like any other aspect of the economy, anything else that has a price attached to it, but also the recognition that this is a way in which most people derive their income. So it has to include economics, but it also goes beyond economics as well. So we're talking about something more than uh, the people, like economists, when they talk about prices, they're thinking about price as a signal of underlying supply right. and demand. And so, you know, a gallon of gas, its price is not determined arbitrarily, it's determined by how much gasoline is available and how much people are willing to pay for gasoline. Right. And so I assume then in the tradition that that's a part of what uh, uh, Catholics have talked about when they've talked about just price, but they're not just talking about that. They're That's talking correct. about something else. And so what makes a price or a wage just or unjust? Well, I think for the, the bottom line for the church is to say, does this allow a person with a family to be able to take care of their basic needs and even more than just their basic needs, the type of things that they need if they want to flourish as human beings. So that's one aspect of the, the idea of the just wage. Uh, we often talk about it in terms of family wage as well to try and specify what we're really talking about here. But at the same time, the church is very conscious that wages are not somehow immune to some of the economic factors that we've already talked about. And so while the church doesn't say that you must mandate, say, let's say $15 an hour as the, the minimum wage. What it does say to employers is that you have to think about more than just the economics of whatever the wage happens to be. That doesn't mean that you just purely reduce it to economics, mm -hmm. but you do need to think about some of these other factors. And some of those factors are frankly beyond employers, beyond businesses. Businesses aren't responsible, for example, for overall economic conditions in a given society. That has a lot to do with uh, the government and the type of institutions that exist in that society. So when we're talking about a just wage, I think one way forward in terms of thinking about this in ways that takes economics seriously, but also re takes what church talks about when it talks about just wage seriously, is to ask ourselves, what's the type of economy that is most likely over a long period of time to allow people to be t paid the types of wages that will allow them to flourish. Now, I happen to think that that's best realized in an economy with limited government and as free a market as possible. Others disagree, but that's a prudential subject that Catholics can, are free to argue about. So that's the question that I'm sure you've been asked and I've been asked many times then. Uh, if we as Catholics believe there's a thing such as a just wage and that there could be wages that are in some way unjust, ought Catholics to support Minimum wage legislation. I mean, the, right. the, the, the one, as you mentioned, that's been discussed uh, for some months now is this $15 minimum wage. And I know from having lived in Seattle that $15 minimum wage, that's actually not a big deal. Babysitters make $12 an right. hour uh, in Seattle, but there'll be other places in the country in which that would be quite high. Um, and, and so what, what would you say if someone said, well, Catholics ought to support minimum wage legislation if they believe the church is teaching about, about just wages. Well, the church's teaching about just wages doesn't translate into a mandate for the government to suddenly decree that the ideal just wage in every, in every each circumstance is $15 an hour or $1 an hour or $200 an hour. Uh, what I think what the church is asking us to think about here is what are the type of conditions that are going to allow us to move in the direction whereby people can pay, be paid the type of wage that allows them and their families to flourish? But there's also an economic side to this, and the economic side to this is that we know that if you start paying people more for a particular job or a particular occupation, more than the market is actually demanding, you will actually probably end up blocking access to the market for people who, for example, don't have many skills mm. uh, or don't, for example, speak the native language and who are quite happy to start entering the marketplace at what some people would consider to be uh, quite low wages. But for them, it's the only way to get into the market 
in the first place. And if you force employers to pay more than whatever that magical number is, uh, guess what? They're not going to employ as many people. They're also going to employ uh, people who are uh, more talented, more skilled, more educated, which means that those people who are less talented, less educated, are probably not to get, going to get those jobs in the first place. In fact, we know that when you introduce minimum wages, it can have very negative effects upon unemployment levels. Now, that might not matter for some people, but if you're a university student who's just looking for a little bit of money to get by, or an immigrant who wants to get a first job to start moving up the economic ladder, then minimum wages can actually act in a way that price you out of mm. the marketplace. So the argument here is not about whether you have some sort of uh, goal that you're aiming mm -hmm. for when it comes to a just wage, but you should be very, very careful when you start talking about using the state to try and realize that because as people like you and I who work in the area of economics all the time say all the time, there are often unforeseen mm. consequences. And one foreseen consequence of having the government get involved in the details of some of these particular issues is that you're probably likely to hurt some poor and marginalized people. The very people that I presume people who are advocates of state mandated, mandated minimum wages are trying to help. Absolutely. I mean, I, I guess that's the irony of this issue mm -hmm. is that uh, it seems superficially that, well, the church talks about a just wage and a living wage, minimum wage, the same language is used. And so the assumption is that a proper translation of Catholic social teaching right into economics and into sort of wage law is going to be to mandate a minimum wage. But at the same time, we have also economic knowledge about the actual effects of coercive right. mandated wages. The way I often put it is it's as if we want to cut off the bottom rungs of the economic ladder. Some people uh, are so unskilled and so uh, uh, inexperienced that they actually need to be able to reach up to a very low rung. And from there, then they sort of work their way up. That's, a, that's an effect that I think most people, certainly most well-meaning people that would support minimum wage legislation, they don't want to do that. They don't want to actually hurt right. people. They're assuming that they'll help people. The danger is, of course, that if you don't look at the actual economic consequences, you may harm the very people that you're wanting to help. I think the other thing to keep in mind here is that when the church talks about a just wage or a family wage, the, the thing that's being stressed here is that we can't just think about wages in a purely supply-demand, economistic way. Mm. We have to think about it in terms of this is the way that large numbers of people are earning their income. So that creates a responsibility, particularly for employers. They need to think about that. That doesn't mean that the state needs to come in and tell them, you must do this or you mm. must pay this. But it's a call for a certain consciousness on the part of employers that in many cases this is the main income for a large number of people. Now, businesses themselves just can't pay wages that are uh, highly extravagant because mm -hmm. the business will go out of business. And one of the things that the church asks us to think about when it comes to thinking about the just wage or minimum wage is the conditions of the business itself. You cannot, it cannot be the case that justice is being served by destroying a business by forcing mm -hmm. it to pay wages that it simply can't afford to pay over long periods of time. And yet that, frankly, is in some respects the direction in which state-mandated minimum wages tend to push businesses. It makes it much harder for them not just to employ people, but also sometimes reduces their margins in such a way that the very viability of the business comes into question. Sam, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Jay. Have you noticed that lots of 20-somethings have recently warmed to socialism? We've noticed it too, and we're a little perplexed. What's the deal with millennials? According to a recent Harvard IOP poll, around one in six young Americans identify as socialist, and a whopping one in three say they support socialism. This is just the latest in a long line of polls showing millennials warming to socialism. That's the bad news. The good news is that few millennials actually know what socialism is. They associate the word with pleasing mental images. They imagine a peaceful Scandinavian village where everyone has a Volvo in the garage, plenty of non-GMO fish and cheese in the pantry, cradle to grave health coverage and job security, and two months paid vacation every year, including six weeks leave for raising new puppies. That's not socialism. Socialism is an economic system in which the state owns the means of production. In its strongest form, as in the early years of the Soviet Union, 
It means the abolition of private property. The word has nothing to do with those pleasing mental images of a Scandinavian village. In fact, I bet poll numbers would change lickety-split if socialism were just defined up front. I've never met a millennial who longed to put Washington, D.C. in charge of everything. On the contrary, millennials tend to be a libertarian lot. They're suspicious of big business and big government. They support the legalization of pot and oppose bureaucracy. Many of them will even prattle on about the glories of unregulated and locally grown produce. That's hardly an idea you'd find in the Communist Manifesto. Very few 20-somethings are gung-ho to have the government literally take over Apple, Starbucks, Microsoft, Chobani yogurt, Google, Ben and Jerry's ice cream, or their favorite food trucks and farmers markets. And then there's the historical record. Socialism has been tried and failed, sometimes quickly and catastrophically, sometimes gradually and failing, not with a bang, but with a whimper. Venezuela is only the most recent attempt at socialism. Just Google recent news about that South American country to learn how it's working out. So to quote Vladimir Lenin, what is to be done? First, millennials and everyone else must be exposed over and over to the monstrous events of socialist history. In the 20th century alone, over 100 million people died at the hands of socialist governments. Socialism is one of the worst economic ideas ever devised by man. Second, we need to expose the false ideologies that inspire socialism. Socialism is based on a false understanding of man and society. This is why Pope Pius XI said socialism, if it remains truly socialism, cannot be reconciled with the teachings of the Catholic Church because its concept of society itself is utterly foreign to Christian truth. Third, millennials and the rest of us need to learn the lessons of basic economics that help explain why socialism has been such a disaster. We need to understand not just that it hasn't worked, but why it can't work. Finally, we need to understand the virtues of economic freedom, not just for the wealthy, not just for Americans, but for the poor, the young and the scrappy, who are willing to work hard to create value for others. A billion people have emerged from absolute poverty since 1990. It was the fruit of enterprise, growing economic freedom, private property rights, and innovation. Socialism had nothing to do with it. That's it for this episode. I hope we've helped you see how your work can truly be a force for good in the world. I'm Jay Richards with the Bush School of Business and Economics at the Catholic University of America. Thanks for joining us.